Our scripture reading today is in the book of Jeremiah 29, chapter 1, verses 4 through 7 and 11 through 13. Today's scripture is selected verses of the book of the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. The leaders of the Israelite people had been deported to Babylon after the burning of the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles with the word of hope from God, but God's promise includes a strange request. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, I will, you will find me. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? O Lord, help us to become masters of ourselves, that we might be the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Six times over the years, I have been blessed to travel to the Holy Land. One of the highest moments of any pilgrimage is the first visit to the city of Jerusalem. Built on a plateau of the Judean mountains, the panoramic views of the city are an unfolding of the biblical story. I am always moved by the close proximity of the sacred sites. Three faiths, all of whom find their ancestry in the patriarch Abraham, live and pray within a block of each other. The skyline of the contemporary city frames the story. At the bottom of the photo, we see the surviving stones of the western wall which surrounded the temple of the Jewish people. These are the temple grounds upon which Jesus walked and worshiped. Now behind the wall on the temple mount itself now rests the iconic Dome of the Rock, that golden structure that is built over a rock upon which tradition says that Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then just a block away in the upper left-hand corner is the gray dome and cross of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built over the site of the traditional site of the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. Now, I visited the Western Wall for the very first time on a Friday afternoon, just as Sabbath was beginning. The Jewish high school students came into the plaza dancing and singing together in Hebrew. The Al-Aqsa Mosque began the Muslim call to prayer just behind the Dome of the Rock. And then the bells from the tower of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre began to ring. Oh my, such a cacophony of joyful noise. All three faiths praying together. 
people of deep differences calling upon the name of God. And I wanted to add my voice to that symphony of prayer. I had a basket with little papers full of prayers from my congregation. I wanted to place these prayers in the crevices of King Solomon's old wall. But I have to tell you, I felt like such a tourist. <laughs> a spiritual tourist, if you will, shy, rather ignorant, and trespassing. But I swallowed my intimidation, singing my way to the wall, hoping that the women would let me in. Now, I want you to explain. You see the crowded part on the right side? That's the women's place to pray. And the open part, the bigger part that's not very populated, is where the men pray. So I had to sing my way through that large crowd of women, hoping they would let me in. <sighs> let my prayer rise up like incense before me. The lifting up of my hands is an offering to you. Oh God, I call to you, come to me now. Oh, hear my voice as I cry to you. I tell you, the women parted like the Red Sea, <laughs> letting me get right up next to those sacred stones so I could place my prayers in those little crevices. I didn't feel like a tourist any longer. When I pastored in Cheyenne several years ago, I first noted spiritual tourists in Wyoming in the events surrounding tragic loss when a young man at Central High School overdosed or when a 19-year-old Army Ranger lost his life in Iraq just five weeks after 9-11. The throngs of people that came to the church were not familiar with the sacred words. They stood outside the building as long as they possibly could in little huddles, little cubbies, clinging to one another, smoking, I think drinking, sighing, tugging at their clothing, knowing that intuitive they had broken some kind of dress code. But they came bringing with them this desperate hope of finding something that would make sense of the senseless. I thought about these young people again when the choir from St. Luke's United Methodist Church, where I was serving, went to New York City to sing at the Lincoln Center. On our sightseeing afternoon, we went to Ground Zero and to the St. Paul's Chapel, which is located on the edge of the World Trade Center Plaza. Since September 2001, this congregation has seen more than two million visitors a year. This prayer wall was packed with papers. And while watching the people, Reverend Ann, their pastor, and I talked about spiritual tourists, the crowds that come to the church to understand the terrorist attacks. She said, we have tourists galore. Since the reconstruction has begun, people come to remember those days, and oh, they come. The choirs want to sing, the artists want to paint. They come by the thousands every single day. But I don't want them to leave as tourists. I want them to become disciples to know what's happening. I want them to connect, to know that there is something more. 
Although few congregations have two million visitors a year, St. Paul's is not necessarily unique. In effect, Reverend Ann's words speak to all religious communities today. Every church, every church sits among a throng of tourists, people on a journey, spiritually homeless, seeking a place to belong, a place of love, a place of understanding. But a journey, a quest, does not automatically mean that people will find meaning. Rather, as Anne suggested, they need to connect. Now, the good news is that in spite of what I call spiritual homelessness, our world is in the midst of an awakening. The first thing I do every morning is turn on the television to check the weather forecast for the day. And in between the day's predictions are always these conversations about the changes in climate, the effects of drought, the emerging El Nino patterns, and the slow-moving hurricanes that bring torrential rains and record flooding. You see, there is a difference between the immediacy of today's weather and the climate patterns over time. In the religious climate of the United States, there has been a falling barometer for the last 50 years, and in the last 20, it has plummeted. You know these changes. According to the Pew Research Center, in the year 1960, 99% of all people in the United States believed in God. In the most recent survey, at the end of 2017, showed that belief in some kind of higher power was at 90%, with only 56% professing faith in the God we know in the Bible. Younger adults under 50 years of age are less inclined to believe in a biblical God, and for people under the age of 30, only 43% believe in the God of the Bible. I spoke to a young friend from Montana just last week who called to greet me about coming north. <laughs> and I mentioned to her these statistics, and Jennifer knows this reality. She and her husband have recently moved their daughter to a parochial school, a religious school, a Christian school, because the child was being bullied for believing in God for wearing a cross, and for attending church services. She was one of the few children in her public school classroom that had a religious affiliation. So in the last two decades, the bottom has simply fallen out of all religious conversations. With the events of 9-11, religion became associated with violence. Six months after the towers collapsed, the Boston Globe broke the story about the Roman Catholic priests who had exploited children in their care. Religion became associated with abuse. In 2004, the Christian church became a political force that could elect a president. And the young people began leaving the church in droves because they didn't want to equate spirituality with politics. And then when the Depression hit, the recession hit, as in the Great Depression, participation in community, in religious community, declined because people can't understand why bad things happen to good people. Yet, in the midst of all of these profound changes, Interest in all things spiritual continues to rise. You feel it, don't you? We have this vacuum inside of us, I call it, that will draw upon an infinite supply of thrills and goods and substances without ever satisfying the heart. We know deep inside that we need some kind of transcendent compass. 
Religious writers say that we're in the midst of a fourth great awakening. I love it. The former church is falling apart and being put back together in a new way. For the last 20 years, 30% of all Americans say that they are, and I know you've heard this, spiritual but not religious. You heard that? However, there is a new group that is growing in size from 9% to 48% just last year, 9 to 48%, that claims to be both spiritual and religious who are looking for church communities that make a difference that change lives. At First Church, you are listening and trying to reclaim faith in a new day. I read your 10-year vision to grow as a downtown church in the heart of Casper. Even in all the changes, you are trying to ask the right questions. Our time is not unlike Jeremiah's. The prophet Jeremiah was speaking to a world that was undergoing sudden and dramatic change. Jerusalem had simply been destroyed, burned after a three-year siege. Many of its citizens were sent to Babylon, which is today Iraq. These events took place in a time of upheaval in the ancient Near East. The mighty Assyrian Empire was declining and the conflict between Egypt and Babylon was growing as they fought over tiny little Palestine in the middle. Chapter 29 is a long letter from the prophet Jeremiah to the exiles who were deported from that burned homeland. Thank you, Miles, for the great explanation. He wrote a kind of prophetic pastoral letter for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, plans for a future with hope. However, his specific instructions were very unexpected and probably made people a bit angry. He said, do not resist this new world that you find yourself in. Carry on with your lives. Learn to come to terms with your situation. Settle in and build homes and families there. And strangest of all is that call to prayer for the very people that had brought about the changes. Those in exile can find their life only as Babylon is a viable place to live for all people. Hmm. Seek the welfare of the city where I have set you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So the exiles begin to remember. They talk about their past. They remember their stories and they begin to write them down. A lot of the Hebrew Bible came together in that time in Babylon. People talking to each other in synagogue, the brand new format of coming together, opening their hearts to this new situation. Now, when I read the recent letters about the bishop's decision to end Pastor Brian's appointment here, so that he could go on medical leave in order to recover, I said to myself, these words remind me of Jeremiah's letter to the exiles after their painful loss of the temple and Jerusalem. And God spoke to me immediately. Janet, remember those instructions to the people. Don't withdraw. I have plans for your welfare and not for harm. Build homes, plant gardens, eat the produce, celebrate your births and confirmations and marriages and all the saints in heaven. 
Go with the flow as I am the river that carries you. Pray. Pray unceasingly. Pray for the welfare of Pastor Brian, for each other, for my church, and for my neighborhood. So the verses on this bookmark are a gift. They're a gift from God. It was confirmed to me multiple times. Yesterday morning when I came in to pray in the sanctuary, I looked up. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future, right on the walls of our sanctuary. And then I've been told several times that Pastor Brian often said that this was his missional verse. This was his go-to verse. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of do 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 You know? You know, you know, that's a word from God, and you attend to it. So over the next year, I want us to bring our Bibles to church every Sunday with a bookmark in Jeremiah 29. We're going to claim that promise, and we're going to pray unceasingly. I believe and trust that God has given this gift with instructions for our healing. Now, as I listen to your stories about Pastor Brian, to your love for Pastor Brian, I realize that you got no opportunity to celebrate his ministry or to even say goodbye. And complicating this lack of closure is the covenant that all United Methodist ministers must sign when they end an appointment and a new person comes in. Brian and I sign a covenant of how we will act towards one another. I will honor Brian and his time of service, and he will honor me and my leadership here. But the tough part is, even though Brian Pastor, can, Brian, uh, Pastor Brian continues to live in Casper, he cannot participate in the church for a year. So this may be one of the reasons why he's not responding to your texts or to your emails or to your invitations. Technically, he can't. And that's hard for you and I'm sure for Pastor Brian. However, when you see Brian at the Walmart, or in the gym, or at a restaurant, or at a school event with Faith or Mo, please, please greet him. Love on him, even if it feels awkward. Just love on him. If you miss him, tell him so. Wish him strength for healing. Tell him that you're praying for him and then do it. Brian is a gifted, prayerful man, and he lifts his prayers to God every day. You are a gifted, prayerful congregation. You lift your prayers to God every day. So let's do what Jeremiah says and pray for the welfare of Brian and our city, for in their welfare, we will find ours. See how that works? God will hear a symphony of prayers and give rest to our souls. Because the prophet ends by saying, when you call on me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. So during the singing of Be Thou My Vision, you're invited to come to the prayer wall and leave a prayer either for our church or for Pastor Brian or for both in one of the crevices.
just like happens in the wall in Jerusalem. No one but God will read those prayers. We'll do this for today, through the week, and next Sunday. And then we will collect all of the prayers after the services. Pastor Mary will bless them. And then we're going to take them out into the courtyard as we do on Ash Wednesday. And we're going to burn them so that those prayers lift in fragrance to God, just like it says in the Bible. We're going to lift them to God singing let our prayers rise up like incense before you the lifting up of our hands as an offering to you come as you are comfortable as we stand and sing together be thou my vision